Hello everyone, this is uh, Professor Zai at MTSU. Let's uh, continue our class. Uh, here's a little leftover from Chapter 5, Risk and Return. After we uh, examined some major measures, how to measure risk and return, uh, let's discuss a little bit more about asset allocation and a complete portfolio. So what is asset allocation? Asset allocation is the portfolio choice among broad investment classes. So what is investment classes? Investment classes are, are different categories of similar securities such as bonds. Right? Bond is investment class. And then you can also find some uh, subclasses among the bonds such as copy bonds or uh, treasury bonds. And uh, you can also say stock, U.S. stock is an investment classes. And also you can say large cap stock as a unique investment class. Small, uh, small stock, another unique investment class, so on and so forth. So asset allocation is an investment decision where you allocate your money into different investment categories. Now. What is complete portfolio? Complete portfolio is a portfolio that contains both risky and risk-free assets. Right? And here you are combining risky securities such as stocks, copy bonds, uh, with a combination of treasury securities. And the treasury securities are considered as risk-free assets. And a capital allocation is just uh, a investment decision where you make choice between risky and risk-free assets. And here essentially you uh, make a decision on the percentage of money that you want to invest in risk-free assets and the percentage of money investing in risky assets. So what is risk-free asset? And risk-free asset essentially is a theoretical term. and uh, uh, risk-free asset refer to an asset that carries no investment risk. How can we say there's no investment risk? Well, in terms of variance and standard deviation, uh, the value of that risk measure is equal to zero. In that case, the asset is defined as risk-free asset. And uh, practically speaking, in the entire world, there is no risk-free asset at all. Why is that? Uh, some people say, hey, treasury bonds is uh, some kind of risk-free asset, but uh, even treasury bonds subject to so-called interest rate risk. When interest rate increases, then the price of treasury bonds will decline. So even treasury securities are not purely risk-free, but uh, in practice, uh, we wanted to find so-called proxies, proxy for risk-free assets. And here we have four potential candidates for proxy of risk-free assets. The first one, treasury bonds. Second one is price index government bonds. Third one is money market instruments. And the last one is CDs or commercial papers. And uh, typically speaking, CDs and commercial papers are not a good candidate for risk-free asset because uh, any CDs or commercial papers carries not only interest rate risk, but also default risk. Right. Let's say you have CD issued by Bank of America. Is that risk-free? Of course not, because there's a chance that Bank of America can go bankrupt. Right. In that case, investor will, sub will be subject to uh, default risk. And the commercial papers are issued by larger U.S. corporations, and uh, corporations have a chance to go bankrupt uh, as well. So both CDs, commercial papers, are not good candidates for risk-free asset. And uh, another candidate is money market instrument. And uh, here, money market instrument uh, uh, can include CD or commercial papers, treasury securities, and other market instruments. And, uh, and those are not good candidates for risk-free assets. And uh, on the Wall Street, people use either treasury bonds or price index government bonds as proxies. Once again, proxy for risk-free assets because those assets do not carry any default risk. Right? And uh, even 
Its security doesn't have any default risk, but uh, investors still may have concern on its interest rate risk. An example here is Treasury bonds, and Treasury bonds have uh, no default risk, but uh, the value of Treasury bonds will be affected by the interest rate. When interest rate increases, bond price will decline, causing the losses for investors. And uh, here, typically, uh, 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 the Wall Street professionals actually choose uh, the Treasury bonds or that has the least amount of interest rate, rate which is T bills. T bills are short-term Treasury securities, uh, maturity range from uh, three months to twelve months, and uh, during a short time period, it's uh, unlikely that interest rate change will cause large fluctuation of bond prices. So, in practice, uh, uh, Wall Street professionals use Treasury bills as a standard proxy for risk-free asset. And in most recent years, some Wall Street professionals turns uh, towards uh, so-called uh, so-called price indexed government bonds and uh, that is another good candidate for risk-free asset. Now let's take a look at how can we do asset allocation across uh, different assets and uh, here we use uh, a very simple example. Let's say uh, we have a combination of a risky asset and a risk-free asset. And a risk-free asset will earn risk-free rate, which is RF. And uh, RP is the return for uh, risky assets. When we combine those two assets together based on certain percentages, uh, we are forming a so-called portfolio. And this is a complete portfolio because it contains both risky and riskless assets. And for this portfolio, what is the characteristics of the risk return trade-off? Well, we can do a little math. And the uh, first one is, we look at the expected rate of return for this portfolio, which is ERC. ERC is the expected return for this complete portfolio. C refers to complete portfolio. And here, uh, the expect rate of return for this complete portfolio equals weighted average return of risky assets and risk-free asset. And the Y here is uh, the weight for each asset. And uh, Y is the weight for uh, y, uh, y is the weight for the risky asset, and uh, one minus Y is the weight for risk-free assets. So essentially the complete portfolio return is weighted average return of both risky asset and risk-free asset. Now let's take a look at the risky nature of this complete portfolio. Well, uh, based, on, uh, based on equation, you can see that uh, sigma c, which is standard deviation of the complete portfolio, equals weighted average standard deviations of those two different assets. Y times sigma RP, which is uh, uh, sigma RP is standard deviation for risky assets, and sigma RF is uh, the standard deviation for risk-free asset. Right. And notice that uh, for risk-free assets, sigma should equal to zero. And also, there's no correlation correlation between risk-free asset and uh, risky asset. So the correlation is also equal to zero. So to simplify this equation, the standard deviation complete portfolio equals y times standard deviation of that risky asset. Uh, figure 5.6 showed you the investment opportunity set of a typical complete portfolio. And uh, this is a two-dimensional picture, and you will see this type of picture a lot in this class. It's, uh, uh, it's the uh, two-dimensional picture reflecting the relationship between, well, two very, very important things to any investor. One is risk, the other one is return. And uh, notice that on this figure you see sigma is on its x-axis. So 
on the x-axis, you see the measure of risk. On the y-axis, you see ER. What is ER? ER is expected rate of return. Right? Why uh, do we need to put E here? E means expected or future return. Right? And uh, it is future return, future risk that really matters for investors. Right? So it's a two-dimensional picture. And this, uh, this blue line, start with RF. RF is risk-free rate. In this case, it's equal to 7%. Right? And uh, the reason why uh, the, the RF is RF is because it's risk-free assets. Right? By definition, it's, uh, its standard deviation should equal to zero. So this 7% is, is virtually the intercept of this blue line. And this blue line will extend upwardly uh, through this straight line. And here you see a positive relationship between sigma and expected rate of return, which means if investor wanted to wanted to improve its return, then they have to bear more risk in terms of standard deviation. And any point, any point on this line represents a very unique combination of risk-free asset and uh, risky assets. For example, on point F, on point F, the weight for risk-free asset is 100% and weight for risky asset is zero. So here you can apply the equation and expect rate of return for that kind of combination of 7% where standard deviation equals zero. And uh, um, another point of P, uh, that is 100% investment in this risky asset, but the 0% in risk-free asset. In that case, uh, the expected rate returns 15% with standard deviation of 22%. Between F and P, you will see a various percentage of money invested in risky asset and risk-free asset. And any point beyond uh, that point P represents the lending opportunity, lending opportunity in this complete portfolio. Let's say this point Y. And the point Y actually go beyond 100% investment in risky asset. It actually borrow money. It borrow money. And uh, it, it, it increased the position of Secure P to 125% of your principal. Uh, I mean, you say you I only have 100% of my principal. How can you uh, buy stock and uh, up to 125% of your principal? Well, it's pretty easy because on the market you can do margin trade. You can borrow money to buy stock, right? and. Uh, uh, in case where you need to borrow money, you pay interest. And an interest rate here is the risk-free rate. And this blue line is also called capital allocation line, or CAL. And the slope of this line showed you the price of risk, price of risk, which is the ratio of access return to standard deviation. And access, I mean, the, uh, the Access return here is 15% minus 7%, that is 8%, and the standard deviation is 22%. So the slope equals 8% divided by 22%. That showed you, that showed you the trade-off of this uh, capital allocation line. All right, so this is a very easy chapter, chapter five, risk and return. Uh, before we move to the next chapter, I really want you to uh, practice some homework questions with me. And uh, before you take it in, you, I, I, my, my suggestion is to practice uh, some homework questions available on D2L. And uh, uh, you should be able to handle most of those questions. And I think uh, uh, this demonstration will show you more details on how to solve each every individual question that you might come across for your homework and exam. Right. Uh, here I do not cover all the questions you might see in your homework and exam. I just show you some typical examples. Right. So 
Uh, here are questions in chapter 5, risk and return. First one. Uh, it asks you to rank the following from harvest average return to the lowest average return from 1926 to year 2010. So here uh, you have four different asset classes, small stocks, long-term bonds, larger stocks, and T-bills. Uh, it asks you to rank its historical returns from highest one to lowest one. Uh, and uh, if you read the textbook, you know that a small stock and the highest return and the lowest return is T-bill. In between, you have larger stocks and long-term bonds. And uh, the correct ranking is 1 small stock followed by larger stocks then long-term bonds and TBL so answer is C second you cannot miss this one the complete portfolio refers to what well that's combination of risky asset and the risky asset so answer is C number three the holding period return stock is equal to what it equals uh, capital gain plus uh, cash yield div uh, divided by the purchasing price. So B is the best answer. The capital gain yield of the period plus the dividend yield for a stock. Number four, the, arith uh, uh, the arithmetic mean, arithmetic average of three percentages. Well, it's very simple. You put everything together, divide by three. That gives you simple average or arithmetic average. Number eight, Similar question, but it asks you the geometric mean, geometric average. And here's the way that you calculate geometric average. Uh, you have three percentages, negative 12%, 20%, 25%. So you uh, take the product of one plus those numbers. One plus negative 12% times one plus 20% times one plus 25%. Then you take one third power of one third and all minus one to get a geometric mean. Answer so here is nine point seven percent. I think uh, it's uh, it's basically useless for you to remember all those numbers, but I want you to remember the process that you will be using solving a uh, specific questions or problems. And number six, an investment earned 10% the first year, earns 15% second year, and it lose 12% third year. So the total compound return over three years is equal to what? Well, here, uh, you look at the total return, right? And the first year is 10%, so that's 1.1. 1 .1, and the uh, second year, 15%, uh, uh, so times that with 1 plus 15% in the third year. You lose 12%, that's time, time with 1 minus 12%, and all minus 1, uh, that will give you a total return, total compounded return for 3 years, which is 11.32%. Uh, Number 7, market risk premium, uh, the definition of market risk premium, and here A is, a is the best answer, the difference between return on an index fund and a return on treasury bills. And the uh, risk premium is uh, uh, the actual return that you can earn by bearing more risk. And here investing market index and uh, the return between market index and the uh, return on treasury bill is the market risk premium. Number eight, uh, it asks you what is the access return? Access return. And uh, this is a very simple question. And the answer, of course, is B, rate of return in access of treasury bill rate. Uh, treasury bill rate here is the proxy for risk free rate. Number nine, your investment has 20% chance of earning 30% rate of return and uh, a 50% chance earning 10% of return and a 30% chance losing 6%. What is your expected return on this investment? So here is application for scenario analysis and expect the rate of return considering all three different scenarios is the weighted average, weighted average return. Right? And uh, the weight here is the probability. 20% for first one, 50% for second one, and 30% for the last one. Right. And uh, you, you simply calculate the weighted average rate of return. 0 0.2 times 
30%, 0 0.5 times 10%, and 0 0.3 times negative 6%. Right, once you put the number together, the calculation slowly and carefully, you will get a 9.2% as expected rate of return. The answer is D, of course. Number 10. Historically, small firm stocks have earned higher return than large firm stocks. When viewed in the context of an efficient market, this suggests that what? Well, if you apply, if you apply the principle of risk return trade-off theory, you would say the reason why small stock earn higher return is because small stock is more risky. Well, and uh, here see exactly uh, exactly offer this argument, small firms are riskier than large firms. So C is the best answer. Number 11. If you are promised a nominal rate of return 12% in your one-year investment, you and you expect, expect the rate of, rate of inflation to be 3%. What a, ra a real rate of return do you expect? Well, uh, you can do this in two ways. First one is a uh, simple way, but uh, it's not uh, most accurate. And uh, the real rate return is difference between nominal rate return and inflation rate. And in that case, we'll get a 9%. 9 right? But uh, this approach ignores the time value of money. And the best way to do this is 1 plus nominal rate of return divided by 1 plus the inflation rate and all minus one. That will give you the most precise answer, which, uh, which equals 8.74%. Last one, number 12. You invest $1,000 in a complete portfolio. The complete portfolio is composed of risky asset with expected rate of return of 16% and a standard deviation of 20%. And a treasury bill with a rate of return of 6%. And a portfolio that has expected value in one year of one one thousand one hundred could be formed if you place what a percent of money in risky asset and what a percentage in risk free asset. Well here you probably want to do a little algebra. You set up the equation so that uh, your, your your total return after one year eleven hundred dollar equals uh, the weight, the weight of weight of uh, your risky asset and weight of your risk-free asset, and your risky asset and 16%, and risk-free asset and 16%. And when you solve this equation, you will get y equal to 0 0.4, which means you put 40% of money in risky asset and 60% in risk-free asset. That concludes demonstration for Chapter 5's homework questions.